I, I'm, I love the game, and I want to get better at the game, but I'm at kind of a roadblock here right now. And I, it does, I think it has been, you know, for me, like, I think the reason why I've been so into it, number one, I just, I get fixated on things that I'm really into. And um, I, but I, to your point, like if I get really, really frustrated at something, I will eventually give up. And I, one of the lessons that I think golf and just life that I really needed was that sometimes you need to ask for help, right? You can't do everything on your own. And as strong as I think I am and as determined and, um, you know, have the ability, because I'm that person, like I'll read something like, um, and when I was growing up, we did not have a lot of money and we did all of every repair that you needed on whatever it was ourselves. And so from a very young age, I was learning how to work on cars, you know, how to fix electrical plumbing. My dad, um, and mom both are very technically minded and owned, uh, you know, an HVAC company. I know you talked about that industry before and they did residential work, but we were taught as little kids, you know, um, how that stuff worked and how to think about things technically. And so for golf, it's very technical, but there are things about it that you just need an expert that understands it to say something to you that's going to help something click. And I found that um, I can take, you know, anything to a certain extent, um, but with help, it just makes it so much more rewarding and less frustrating. So I think it'd be good for you to get an evaluation and take a couple lessons. Yeah. But again, it's, you know, we talked about it before. It's the trust factor. Like, yeah. you know, you're you're putting yourself out there. And now you're going to put your your golf game in the hands of somebody else that you know maybe you don't know. And you know, I, again, it's the DTA. Don't trust anyone. You know, you're going to put your swing into this guy that you're going to you're going to have to believe right off the bat that this guy has your best interests at heart, and he's not yep. just going to try to put you in a cookie cutter swing because right. this is what works. And if you don't do it this way, well, you can't do it. And that will be we talk about intimidating or whatever, that'll be something that will, will stay with me for a long time. Those type of negative. And again, I'm already in the negative frame of mind. It's like, you know, if I get into this, it's, I'm, I might not be happy with it, but somewhere down the line, I got to just, you know, take the leap of faith and go and see somebody and, and work on some stuff. And then if you work on stuff, start working on stuff. Now there's going to be a phase where you're working on stuff and yep. that's going to take, that's going to take some time to figure out. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a process, but when you look at it for the next, you know, 20, 25 years that I'll be playing, it's a very, it's a small drop in the bucket for, to take some, you know, even if you take a season out of there, right? Yeah, no, you're right. But I do hear what you're saying because for me, I mean, I didn't realize it, but golf is so important to me and the game is so important to me and the progress that I've made that it, you are taking your baby pretty much and you're putting it in somebody's hands and you're saying, and there are, there's a lot of bad advice out there. I mean, you know that you've heard that. And there are a lot of people that just want to loop you into, you know, this like pattern of taking a ton of lessons and spending a lot of money and really for what, not actually making an improvement. Um, and it might just be that you just don't connect with that person. There could be somebody that's really successful as a swing coach, um, you know, that helps a lot of different people. But for some reason, you two just aren't right for each other. It's like dating, you know, and trying to find your match. And um, and it and I think, too, for me, somebody that has been in the dating scene for a bit, too, sometimes people come and go. There's like a season that makes sense for them to be part of you and your swing. And then there's time where they don't make sense for you anymore because you have reached a point where you've plateaued together and it's just not working anymore. And like the breakup's hard too, you know, it's like <laughs> finding somebody is really hard, breaking up with somebody is even harder, I think. Um, and, and it, especially if you like that person, and a lot of times you do, you know, you've built a relationship with them, um, you know, you spend a, a fair amount of time with them. And, you know, in, in four hours of playing golf with somebody, that's a lot of time to talk, you know, and, and to talk about a lot of different things. And so you do build a relationship with people. But it is, um, you know, I've heard some of your other guests talk, I feel really fortunate that through you know, my um, entrance into the golf community here, I've moved through it really quickly and made lots of connections. And then that have made um, a lot of friends who are very talented in, you know, the teaching aspect. And I actually, right now, um, I have a swing coach that I see. I have my former swing coach that I still stay in contact with and he helps me with things. And then I also have a really, really close friend that I spent a lot of personal time with who also happens to be 
a, co a coach and you know we play golf together a lot and um and then i've got some good friends that i play with that are always learning new tricks and tips and what i appreciate about them is they don't force them on me and they don't say hey you should do this or hey why don't you try that they you know i might they might see me struggling with something and um they'll say, would you like me to give you my point of view on this? Um, no harm, no foul. If not, I just, you know, I was watching some things or I could take a video of this for you or whatever, which is really nice, but it, it's, it's a lot. It's intimidating to try to find somebody yeah. and, uh, and put your trust because you, you're, you're getting around the course. Like we talked about, you know, just fine. And like, all they have to do or say one little thing and all of a sudden you can't get around the course even anymore. <laughs> yeah. That would be just, detrimental to me playing golf but uh yeah somewhere it's got to happen there has to be a next step here in my golf game and and i just gotta get out of my own head going and do something about it but yeah uh, in yeah. your own time you will you know and yeah that, yeah when yeah. i get frustrated enough but that's the thing i don't want to get so frustrated where where i won't be i won't be receptive to to the changes because i'm i'm so wound up about where i am in the game right so yeah again this game is so mental and can deal with like it's it's the negative the negative thought patterns are way more intrusive than the positive thought patterns and if you have some positive thought patterns one one negative one can just just derail all those positive in this game it's it's absolutely absurd it really is. You know, I caught, um, I think in baseball, they call it the yips. And I caught a case of that, like, you know, um, especially in the winter, like I was playing all winter long because um, I was training for a um, marathon that I ended up just completing a couple weeks ago. And it was, um, you know, our golf season here, like your golf season is really super short and it was freezing cold and raining on me. And when I'm uncomfortable playing golf, it's hard for me sometimes to keep my head, my mind in the right headspace. And I just like, I, I got this block and it was like, every time I went out, I'm like, Oh, I'm going to play terrible because the course is going to be saturated and it's all muddy. And, and I was like down in life too. I'm like, you know, this is what I get for living somewhere where I can't play golf all year, you know? And then I started going down that spiral. It's like, maybe you should live somewhere where you can play golf all year. And why don't you do something about that? And if golf is so important to you, why do you suffer through this winter? And <laughs> it was funny because I'm, that's what I'm thinking about that instead of thinking about like just going out there and hitting a ball and I'm spending lots of time, energy and money, you know, like sabotaging myself, you know, when I'm out there. And I noticed um, when I stopped doing that and I just went out there and said, you know what, it's raining, it's cold. But guess what? You're still able to get out here and play golf and you aren't going to play great. It's going to be OK. You're still going to get a couple good shots in. You're going to be able to practice a lot of technique and, um, you know, that's fine. And you'll be able to play soon enough. It will be the golf season and you'll be playing comfortably again. Yeah, but, I don't know if you checked but, out um, our couple episodes ago, our Strathmore shenanigans. That was our second tour date on the Alberta Golf Tour. And we got rained out that day. And I am a fair weather golfer to the extreme and that day was one of the most miserable days I've ever ever played golf because I was woefully unprepared for for the weather that we get here and again I'm not used to travel golf because I don't travel a lot for golf like usually it's just like day trips one hour here one hour there to to little local muni courses that we have around here so this was the first time I like left our city and was going to have no access to to anything other than what I brought with me. And I was woefully unprepared. And the misery that I went through that day, I'm taken care of now because it didn't take me long to get another jacket in the bag, a rain set in the bag of a, a raincoat and pants in the bag and a really quality umbrella. Now I'm ready to go on tour again and deal with the elements that come up. But I am totally a fair weather golfer. Like if I see a cloud in the sky, like a dark cloud, and I, it's going to like, my mind is already like, yeah, I'm not going to fucking do this today. <laughs> no way i don't want to i'm going home i'm playing nine holes if it's raining i'm going to get in the van and go home but yeah, yeah. i know you're talking about going to st andrews and i'll tell you um you know band in dunes is designed after that and uh, i went in june like the end of june last year and they say 
that, you know, banned in, you never know, but it almost always is going to be about 60 and raining, drizzling at some point, And the wind is just going to be ripping through there. And, you know, that taught me something because I was there um, and I'm on these bucket list golf courses, looking at these beautiful views and I am cold and the wind is ripping. And it was the first time my caddy looked at me and I, I had a bunch of bunker shots. Cause I mean, I'll tell you, I played, um, I think I shot if I recall, it was a 121 <laughs> on Pacific, which is funny, you know, because here I am, I'm banned in dunes and with a caddy, like, you know, shooting 121. This guy is like, it was the nicest guy ever. He's actually coming to Seattle in September. We're friends and we're going to go to some games and play some golf. And, but he stuck with me through this experience. Um, but I'm getting ready to get in the bunker and do a bunker shot. And he's like, hey, when you hit the ball, immediately close your eyes and turn your head toward me. He goes, I know it's counterintuitive. Don't look toward the green where it's going to go. He's like, and don't keep your eyes open. And I was like, really? And he goes, if you want to keep your eyeballs, that would be <laughs> my that would be my call here. And so, and I noticed as soon as I hit the ball, the wind was so intense that the sand just came back and it completely like sandblasted like the side of my face. And if I would have had my eyes open, that would have been bad. But that extreme weather, it was like, I was miserable because I hear, I was looking forward to going on this trip. I couldn't believe I got invited to go. Um, and I get there and I actually ended up with a frozen shoulder three weeks before I'm supposed to go. And I'm like, oh no, this would be my luck. And fortunately my pressure point therapist um, that I see, that's part of this whole group that we started talking about earlier. He was able to fix my shoulder and I was able to go. And so I felt like when I got there that I had like overcome like this massive feat to even be there. And then I get there and I start to play and I'm like not having a good time. I'm like miserable because of the weather and I'm miserable because of like um, how cold it is and everything and i had packed like a ton of stuff you know clothes wise and so i was i was prepared from that standpoint it was just all me in my head you know just not being in fair weather and being bummed i'm like thinking it's the end of june i expected it to be sunny i know people said it wouldn't but i just had this like hope that it would um probably about six holes in like something snapped in my head and i think it was the constant positivity of my caddy who's out there every single day of his life pretty much doing that in all weather just like going hey you're on the most beautiful one of the most beautiful golf courses in the world like there are most people will never have the opportunity to even play this course you know when you when you think about it like that and you're with some really cool people and um you know he's like it's awesome that you've only been playing for two years and you're out here doing this he's like a lot of people wouldn't even you know, and i played you know 36 holes a day you know i was like going hard fast you know um and anyway, I think that um, that taught me a lesson that, you know, like you can you can your your mind is more powerful than you give it credit for. And there's a lot of things that I think we have been. I know I'm soft now. I have central air conditioning. You know, I'm perfectly temperature controlled um, morning, noon and night. But like at the end of the day, you know, I can be out in some elements and still have a really great time and not let it ruin my psyche. Um, but it, it and, and it feels good when you get done doing something like that. And, you know, you were able to overcome it. So I guess another like I, I think side benefit of golf is it showcasing that your mind's a powerful thing and that your body is a lot more capable than you give it credit for a lot. I'm still trying to work on getting through those type of situations because I <laughs> hate it. I absolutely hate it. I, I, I you know, I'm like, I always ask me, why are you putting yourself through this? What are you getting out of this? And it's like, I just need to go back to dude. If you, even if you just get the walk in, you get, you're getting the exercise out of the day. Right. But I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to work myself through that as well. But, you know, I think the more we play, like, on on a tour and the more places we go, because we're going to play Mickelson National in Calgary on August the 6th. And next year, that course is going private. So this is, like, our opportunity to get on that course. And yeah. I'm going to bring all my rain gear. <clears throat> I'm bring all my clothes. Because it doesn't matter if it does rain that day. I'm playing 18 at Mickelson National. So that's what it's I'm looking so forward great. to. And, you know, you should come and uh, play the summer solstice uh, down here in um, Seattle. It's actually in Tacoma at Chambers Bay, which is another, you know, beautiful golf course that we are fortunate enough to have here. That's actually a public course, but really expensive and really hard to, you know, to get into to play. Um, but you should do that because it'll help you. Like, I didn't think that I was capable of walking 30 miles in one day, you know, 16, and playing 16 straight hours of golf 
you know, 72 consecutive holes. I was like, that's, I mean, all the guys I play with that are, you know, like we were talking about earlier that you play with that are way younger and in great shape, like the best shape of their life. You know, I tried to convince a bunch of them to be on my team. They're like, absolutely not. Are you crazy? They're like, we like golf. We're trying to continue to like golf. It sounds like you're just trying to torture yourself. What you and, um, you know, the reason why we did this was, um, and I, I, I told you the story, you know, before we got started, but some of the detail around it is there are a hundred people that do this and all of the money that they raise goes towards supporting our local chapter here for First Tee. And it's a big part of their operating budget every year. Um, you know, they raised over a hundred and um, almost $190,000. And, you know, so 120 of that, um, I think actually it's a little bit more than that goes directly to First Tee. And that's a big part of like what they need to continue to provide the programming to children that don't have access, you know, a lot of times to golf and and um, the life skills to, to, you know, maybe be able to apply for some of the college scholarships and stuff that they do. And uh, anyway, they do this every year for the last five years. Um, and it's actually not put on by First Tee, but they're the benefactor. Um, it's put on by a gentleman who just happens to be a huge fan and uh, of First Tee and wants to do this to support them. And um, so a bunch of my friends are doing it and we find out that there aren't really that many women that have ever signed up and there haven't been any women. Um, there hasn't been a woman foursome that's competed in it or completed it. And so um, we decided uh, to take four women from the nonprofit group that I'm in and be the first women to train for it. And the women that I played with were all different ages, all different physical fitness levels. And, um, you know, I remember like the, the day before everybody's like, are you guys ready? And I'm like, I don't think you can ever be ready for this. I think you just go out there and you just try it and you see what happens. But, you know, mentally I'm ready, you know, and uh, I don't, I've never, I've never walked 30 miles, you know, in one day. I've never played 72 holes of golf. I've never, you know, been out in the, all the different elements, you know, for that long. I've never, you know, taken 500 swings because, you know, again, you know, four rounds, well, that's a lot of swings and, you know, cutting out practice wins and stuff. So we're going to see what happens. And um, they hadn't done it either. And, you know, it was, it was crazy because um, mentally I found that I, st I just kept myself, I practiced more of being in a positive headspace than I did. And I did my fair share of like physical training for this, but, you know, I really only started taking the training seriously about 45 days before the whole thing, you know, and I'm a fairly active person, but again, like this level of activity is something that I have just never done. And the reason why we decided to do this is because, um, I don't know if you've heard about the dream gap, but, uh, there is a gap in what little girls and little boys, you know, aspire to be when they grow up. That's pretty significant. And a lot of it has to do with little girls not seeing women do things um, like different, like be president of the United States as a, as a, you know, example. So they say that little girls by the age of five years old have totally given up any and all hope that they could ever do that someday because they just don't see women doing those things. And so we, um, felt that we had a responsibility to like show little girls that, you know, um, especially the ones that maybe are getting this, um, you know, funding for the programming in first tee that like, if someday you want to grow up and you want to do summer solstice and do a marathon, you can absolutely do that. There isn't any limitation to you believing that you could do that. And just to really symbolize that that's, um, you know, we're trying to show golf is really a good avenue for that. Like you and I were talking about, you know, men and women can compete in the sport pretty equally. Um, and as it continues, um, you know, to shift and change, I think that that's a really awesome space because there isn't a lot of those, um, you know, where, uh, people can come together, you know, and feel like, you know, there is, there is a, you know, equal chance and being able to compete with that. So you should do it because, um, I think it's 99% mental and 1% physical. And, um, if, if I know that's how I made it through it, at least, <laughs> and I think my friend, I think I still have to work on my mental capabilities then if, if, if it's 99% mental, cause, uh, yeah, I'm not there yet mentally. <laughs> I think you're, I think you are. I think you could do it. Definitely. Yeah. I, I, I bet you could. Um, and I couldn't have done it without, you know, the camaraderie of my team. There's no way that was a huge factor in being able to complete that. I know that my team was really, really positive. And um, what was one of them, I think I have to talk about this because it just, it touched me so deeply. Um, 
one of the women on our team, um, she had her husband or her husband just decided to meet us in the back nine of the third round of the day and handed her seven year old daughter like over the fence and put her on the course. And she walked like six holes with us as we were like, you know, I mean, we were really tired coming around the back nine of the third round, you know, and that's when you needed kind of the extra boost to go, okay, we got this. We can do 18 more after completing this. And it had rained on us in the morning. It was really cold and then it had got excruciatingly hot. There is no shade. Tessa and I both are very, very light, fair complected, and we were getting absolutely scorched. And, you know, we were putting sunblock and stuff on, but still when that heat is like beating on you like that, and you don't have time to be like under an umbrella, your caddy's carrying your bag. You're not, they're not push carting, you know, so you can't walk under that umbrella. And, um, he brought anyway, he brought her daughter and, and handed her over and she walked with us and watching her watch her mother like complete something like this and watching her husband walk along the sideline cheering all of us on. It was like, we got this, we can do it. We can push past all the pain. And, you know, both of us have knee. Christina and I both have knee injuries, I think. Um, two of the others do too. And I mean, I was definitely feeling it. I limped down the, um, when I hit my tee shot on the 72nd hole, it was straight downhill from nine to, um, the green. And it was actually, that was my first and only birdie of the day. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I guess that might be a little embarrassing to say it took me 72 holes of golf consecutively to be, I'm playing the same par three, four times to be able to birdie it. But, um, the 72nd hole, I hit like a really great tee shot and it landed on the green. It was still a pretty long putt, but I was, um, you know, I was hobbling down the hill to get down there. And when I got down there, I was just like, okay, you know, I know you're in pain, but like you can birdie this. And like, I, so there were a lot of mental aspects to it, but anyway, it was really encouraging for, um, for her husband to bring her daughter. And that was like the last I think boost that we needed to be able to like push ourselves through it. So it was definitely a team effort and you'll have people that will be there, you know, cheering you on and providing moments of inspiration for you like that too. Well, when we get into, when we start doing some of that, uh, you know, travel, we will consider, cause we've, we've been invited to quite a few places all over the U S to go and, and play with some people and, you know, down the road, we would really, really like to, go and meet some of these people that we've been friends with since we started this whole thing and uh, get around to golfing with them. It would be just icing on the cake for what we're doing, I, I think. Don't you think that that's like one of the one of the other just like most amazing things about this game is like meeting people from I've met people like you, for instance, I meet people from all over the world yep. and you develop a relationship and a lot of people diss social media relationships and say, oh, you don't really know that person. You don't really. I mean, that's a fake relationship because that's a fake, you know, a version of your life. And I'm like, it can be, you know, and I'm not going to sure. deny that that's not out there. But it also can actually um, help you meet people from all different places with all different perspectives that all enjoy one thing in common, which is the game of golf. And it gives you the opportunity to travel and see places and play with people that, you know, and just broaden your experience so much. Like we were talking about earlier, I learned so much from different people, both in life and about golf on the golf course. And I just, that is one of, I think, one of the most beautiful things about this game for me me um like you and I both we're both introverts like we talked about and a lot of people yep. probably won't believe that but look at how therapeutic it has been it has allowed us to have the space to be able to come out of our shell and, I think the whole social media relationship thing I mean if you're if you're looking for somebody to marry through social media that's probably not going to work out the best for you. <laughs> <laughs> like what we're doing here and what we do with our other guests like our common denominator is golf right so yeah. you know having that having that as the base you can build your friendships relationships off of having that as your base right golf is the sphere that's bringing us to together I mean, you know i'm not looking for another wife and and, and <laughs> you know what i mean i'm not yeah. looking for that i'm looking for the connections in the golf world and that you know so that when you post something now down the road about golf on your socials i'm like you know i comment on that i like that right same thing with us like it's like, oh, now now that we've connected and we're, you know, we've actually, you know, had a little bit of screen time here and we chatted, you know, your golf experience becomes important to me and ours becomes important to you. And that's how we 
that's how the friendship and relationship grows. It's the same thing with other people that we've met, had on the podcast, or we just, people that listen to our podcast that, you know, probably will never be on the podcast, but they like what we're doing. Like we have those conversations. Like, how did you, how did you shoot today? You know, like, where are you? What, what's coming up? Like we have those conversations and yeah, those aren't fake. And you know, the people aren't fake either. No, I mean, you know, you had one of my, one of my friends that I met through, you know, it's funny cause we, we did meet in person, but we, um, we met like doing golf stuff together, you know, and, and through we're now social media, we do a lot of stuff together, you know, matched at golf, Dane and Amber, and they're incredible people, you know, and they're wonderful. And I would hang out with them anytime. And, you know, I can't wait to go down to Portland. It's a three hour drive from here, but I'm going to make the trip down there just to see Dane's place, you know, right? Because again, those of you that don't know, Dane, who's a past guest of ours, just opened a, uh, a, a shop. And he's, we're going to get him on the podcast once he gets a little more yeah. straightened away and a little more, you know, gets his time management a little more down. Uh, we're going to get him back on the podcast to have a chat about his, uh, about his shop for sure. And, and where oh, that's right. going. Cause yeah, he was a good guy. Uh, had he a really good a- chat, had a really good chat with him as same thing as us before. And after we did the podcast, we had a really good chat and, uh, yeah, really good, really good guy. And, and again, that's, I, I, I talked to him regularly, especially when he posts this stuff about his new shop, right? You, you got to give yeah. him kudos for it, right? Definitely. But an example of that's a real person that's really cool that you have a real relationship with. And yes, um, it's been afforded through, you know, golf and social media. And I think that social media gets a really bad rap. You know, I got a lot of heat for it in my day job and like it actually was the demise of, you know, my day job. And, um, it was, it was, I was asked to make a choice and I decided I'm not doing that, that, that isn't, you know, that's not the way the world works these days. And, um, I have met a lot of really great people through here that have been very impactful in my life. And I met and outside of social media, just golf in general, you know, like the people that I meet on the course or the people that I meet doing the work that I'm doing with the nonprofit groups that I'm doing it with. Like I've met people that will be, you know, in my life forever. You know, my two best friends I met through this and, um, you know, I've, I've even, you know, met like you were talking about love interests, you know, not on Instagram, but I definitely met them on the golf course or through <laughs> golf. And, you know, I never thought that that would be possible. Um, but, you know, I have realized that like having golf be a big part of my life. I do a lot of travel golf and um, I want to continue to do that for the rest of my life. And, you know, as I go to look into my retirement years and all of that, I hope it's like something that I can enjoy with the closest people in my life, whether that is a husband down the road someday, or, you know, um, just my dearest friends, you know, I don't want, I don't want there to be separation in that. So, um, I, I love that it's afforded me, um, all of these new relationships, both, you know, social media wise and, uh, business wise and, you know, friendship and, and otherwise it's been great. Yeah. So this has been a great chat, but before we go and wrap this up, um, you know, let's get into a little bit of the golf geek stuff. So what are you rocking? What are you rocking into the, in the golf bag right now? Cause I know you <laughs> said you, you have a relationship with PXG. So let's hear about, let's hear about what you got, what you're rocking in the bag. Yeah. Okay. So I'm kind of a little odd. Um, I have 13 clubs in my bag, which I know a lot of people have 14, but I really like the number 13 and it didn't actually start out that way. I had 14 in my bag. And I've been fitted a couple times. Like I mentioned, I'm on my fourth set of golf clubs in three years. Um, And not because the first ones uh, from PXG that I had weren't good for me. It was because I decided to change some things. And as my swing is changing um, and as new technology is coming out, I'm kind of a gearhead. So like I want to stay up to speed with the latest and greatest. Um, So right now I'm I have the Black Ops driver from PXG. Um, and I have a, a tour AD shaft, which a lot of people like freak out. They see that too. I'm like really new golfer with like an incredible, um, 
driver. That's probably way better than I am, but you know, <laughs> I, I, it's fun to play with and I really like it. Um, so I've got that, I've got a four wood, um, that's also from the black ops, uh, PXG line. And then I've got a, um, it, I'm calling it a five and a half hybrid. It's a five hybrid that's set to 26 and a half degrees. I used to have a five and six hybrid in my bag, which was a little bit weird. And so my fitter and I decided we were going to get rid of the six and that we were just going to change the five. It's also a black ops too. So I just re recently got rid of the gen five clubs. Um, and really not because I don't like them. Uh, I donated them to one of the other women that's learning how to play in our group. And that's usually what I do with my, um, with my, my previous clubs, I could try to like hand them down or gift them to people that don't have them. Um, and then I've got a, um, I've got the Gen 5 irons in my bag and I, I have a 789. That's as low as I go, which is kind of weird. I know again, but for my game, that's how I play. Um, I've got a seven wood. I almost forgot about that one. Um, and it's also a black ops and I really like that, that club. Seven um, wood has become a more popular. It's one of my favorite clubs. Like one, I, one of the guys in our crew that we play with, he, he has a seven wood in his bag. Yeah, I didn't play it for, I had one the entire time I've been playing and I didn't play it for the first two years. And one of the friends I play with often that I do some collaboration with, he's really obsessed with the seven wood. And he kept saying, he's like, why don't you try your seven wood? Why don't you try your seven wood? And I was like, I don't know. I just like, I tried a couple times, just not feeling it. And um, that's something I've learned too. Now I don't have a club in my bag that I'm not willing to get out of my bag and hit. And I try not to get into one of those mental places with any of my clubs. Like uh, during this marathon for the solstice, I bet you I could not hit a tee shot to save my life. And I was hitting my four wood really solid. And, you know, my caddy said to me, he's like, most people I know would have kept their driver in the bag and they would have just started teeing off with your four wood. And I was like, that driver is not beating me today or any day. And even if I have to hit it a billion times really poorly, I'm not going to put it in my bag and, and not take it out when it's appropriate for me to use that club. And, um, Anyway, so so there's that. I've got a ton of wedges. I'm a wedge person for some reason. So I've got a pitching wedge. I have a gap wedge and I have a 52 and I have a 56. And then I've got, um, I, I love, if I can hit a shot with a wedge, that I'm going to try to do it. I just have been a big fan of those. Um, and right now where I'm at in my game, you know, it's marginal, the differences between some of these clubs anyway. Um and then I've got a putter and I've got the closer from PXG. Oh, I have the sugar daddy wedges. And then I've got the the closer from PXG. So I rock a full PXG bag. PXG bag, yeah. Yeah. That and makes I mean, sense. I've tried everything though. I will tell you, I, I started out with Cobras and no, no knock on Cobra. It just wasn't the brand for me, not the set for me. Um, that was off the shelf set. And then I went to uh, PXG. Well, I went to Ping actually next. And I was playing a G425 driver and um, it, it was great. Um, and I, I was playing tailor-made hybrids um, and I was playing, um, uh, oh gosh, uh, Odyssey putter and, you know, a mallet putter. And I switched, um, oh no, um, I just got a phone call and I wonder if that messed up our video. I'm so sorry if it nope, did. Everything is good. And it's okay, okay because I can, I can edit this a little bit. It's not, a, not an issue. Okay. Um, yeah. So anyway, um, I've tried ping and then I've tried tailor made and I've tried odyssey. I've tried Cobra and I've tried several different versions. I've had the gen five, um, and now the black ops of, you know, PXG. And I I'm just, a. I don't know. I really like PXG their stuff. I like the fitting experience. I like the way that you can customize everything about their clubs from the weight to, you know, um, all of the different, um, lie angles. And, you know, I can switch out shafts on them, like as I'm changing and my swing speeds changing and I've switched my grips, you know, they're, they're really customizable. So I'm a, I'm a big fan. What about you? Actually, I'm curious. Uh, like actually, yeah. It's, um, so I'm a, probably my bag is split. So driver, three wood, five wood, um, tailor-made, uh, irons are Wilson D sevens. I rock the Kirkland wedges in my bag and nice. I wrote, I rotate, I rotate Odyssey putters through my bag. Um, I've got an Odyssey, uh, Odyssey number five in the bag right now. Uh, that's <laughs> actually the putter that I, I found I like the most. So yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, I, I like Wilson cause I have, 
I have like three Wilson bags and a couple okay. sets of Wilson irons. Um, but I think when I go to get fitted, that will eventually happen. Then my Wilson days are going to be done. I, I don't know about, do they allow you to customize them? I mean, can you change the shafts and the weights and the, yeah, for, yeah. for sure. But I think that when I make that next step, it's going to be, I'm not quite sure what brand I'm going to go to. Uh, I haven't really thought about it much because I'm my a lot of my focus is on just trying to play the game as it is right now. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. There's there's probably in the next couple of years going to be a brand change, and when I go to a brand like I've been a Wilson guy since I started like this, and again there's a story behind the Wilson thing in me. Um, but uh, yeah, there might be a brand change coming down the road, and and I will have the same thing. I'll have the entire bag one brand. And I, yeah. and, and I probably won't deviate from that brand unless, you know, you know, heaven forbid somebody comes and gives offers as a brand deal somewhere else. But, you know, we'll, we'll talk, a, we'll, we'll talk about that when, the, when the time comes. Yeah. I think most people I play with have a mixed bag of some sort, you know, the people that I play with, you know, from PXG, we all play PXG, but like, um, you know, for, I, and I, I definitely do not, I could switch out and do whatever I want. I think it's funny you talk about putters. I didn't realize. I remember walking through the golf store before I got into golf or the golf section of a store. And I was like, who needs all this stuff? And like, <laughs> where do they keep all this stuff? And why would you need multiples of this stuff? And I've got four putters in my living room right now, right behind me. I mean, and I keep my. <laughs> I think I got 13 in the office right here. Um, well, and people laugh because it's like my golf bag has the best seat in the house. Like, and I've got, I've got golf stuff on golf stuff on golf stuff. Like it's, I've got it in my storage unit. I've got it in my car, but I, I bring my bag in my, my clubs. I bring in every single day. Yep. You bet. You know, my, playing, my, my playing set is, is right there. That's where my playing set is. Then the tour bag has my, uh, my old set of Wilson irons in it. Kind of like, a, um, I think they're Jerry Pates. And I, yeah. cause I wanted an old set of Wilson clubs. Because again, I my wife says I can't get into the collector part of golf because that'll get too ridiculous. So yeah. I, I got one set of old Wilsons and I got a tour bag, but my playing set is right there and they are usually always here because they got to be close. Even if they don't treat me well, they got to be close. They got to be close. I know they bring me so much joy. I never thought I would look at them and be like, oh, they're attractive or I like looking at them. And that's when I walked through the store before. And now how I see it, it's so different. And, you know, and there's a lot of options. You know, there's a lot of ugly golf stuff. out there. And, it's, really and again, but, being being relatively new to the game, I would have loved to have the opportunity to try everything. Yeah. But I know that's the kind of not realistic now, right? But like if I would have grown up in the game, you would have had the opportunity to try the TaylorMade R7 you know, which was a really good line for them. And, you know, try the first brand of Cobra and all that, but I'm not there. So I just kind of got to go with what we got and, you know, see what happens. Yeah. And I, I like, you know, I fortunate, I just dove headfirst into this and made a lot of friends that are in the industry and I can ask a lot of questions and that I, that's like my only hobby, you know, and I don't, like we, I don't have pets. I don't have plants even that need me to, you know, take care of them. And so I spend pretty much every waking second that I'm not sleeping, eating or working, you know, trying to research or do something or talk golf. So. golf yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. It, it, again, it takes up a lot of my time as well. You know, I, I have a job, but like, even, even like now when we're done here, um, you know, I'm going to go on, check the socials and there's going to be conversations about golf and what happened today on PGA and, and other things that are happening in, in the golf world. And it's like, yeah, it takes up, it takes up a lot of my time, but, it's not, it's not a chore. And that was one of the things is if this ever became a chore, uh, probably it would, it would fade away really quick. Yeah. But it, it's not a chore. It's, it's definitely a lot of fun when you get to chat golf with people. That's for sure. It is. And that's what, as I think about the next chapter of my career, I really want it to be related to golf somehow. And a lot of my friends that work in golf, you know, say, don't do that. You're going to lose your passion for it. And I get some that are in it that say, no, that's not true. You know, just like any job, you just have to find balance in it and make sure that you, because I am so into it. You know, I have a lot of friends. I, I was hanging out with a friend last night and, um, you know, we had went into the baseball game and done some things and I'm trying to chat about some golf event stuff that we've got coming up. And it's like nine o'clock at night and they're like, hey, 
Mm -mm. Like boundaries. <laughs> we gotta have we gotta have boundaries here. You're gonna want them too because if you do decide that you want this to be, you know, more than just a hobby and more than just because um, as we were talking earlier, right now I'm really trying to branch out into this niche place as a female golfer that is in, in her mid 40s. Um, that's just trying to become a resource to help other people that are getting into the game, but also then leveraging, you know, my strengths and my passion, um, both in golf and um, for helping connect people and um, doing my part to maybe coach and, you know, give something back that, you know, I've been given as far as opportunity. And uh, they're like, just make sure that if you do make this, you know, your job that you do find a way to continue to find something else to focus on and balance so that you don't get burned out. Cause like you said, when it becomes an obligation instead of a choice, that's when you lose, you know, you lose it. And I don't you ever lose a part of, of what brought you into the sphere, I believe. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to be really cautious not to do that, but I am really excited because I do hope that, um, you know, conversations with you like this become a more regular part of my day and not just, um, you know, that I've, I've been looking forward to today. I, I knew it would be, um, a really great conversation based on the podcast that I've heard of yours, which I've, I've been, you know, a big fan of listening to since um, I found out about you. And uh, I don't want this to just be a special occasion or like a, you know, a fun thing that I do. I hope it becomes something that I'm doing on a more regular basis. That's awesome. Um, yeah. I can't wait to see where it goes. Cause again, you know, we'll, Thanks. we'll, we'll end the podcast here shortly, but you know, we still have, there's still a road to, to, to walk and, and enjoy and, and that's where I, that and again, now the pot, now that we're ending the podcast, I'm starting to get excited about golf again, because there's still that continuation, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. And yeah, definitely. If there's, um, I can't wait to see like, you know, you, you've got a lot of great guests and momentum building and I'm looking forward to seeing others that come on and, you know, definitely willing, if there's anybody in my sphere that you want to connect with, I would be more than happy to do that. That's one of the things I like to pride myself on is that, you know, I think, uh, I love having a big network of people, but not just for me to be like, Hey, look at all the people I know, but really defined like the pattern between two people that maybe they don't see and connect them because there's so many people out there trying to um, make golf a better place and space for everyone. And I know you're doing that too, as a new golfer, you're talking about your experience and your friend's experience. And I think the more opportunities that people have to hear that honestly from just people that are trying to play, not, you know, cause right now, a lot of the resources you have, you're learning about, you know, the professionals or people that grew up with golf their entire life. And there's a whole big group of us that got into it during COVID that didn't have those experiences that don't have as many resources to turn to that we can relate to. And I think it's really cool what you're doing. Um, and uh, I hope and know that I likely will run into people that I think you should know and should know you. And uh, the door is always open for any and all. Really, I appreciate that. that. That is awesome to hear, um, you know, uh, not that it validates what we're doing, but it, it does put it into perspective of um, just that we're, we're guys that just really love the game and we want to share that love with, with other people, of other like-minded people. Because this game has given, this game has been, again, like just like you, this game has been so much to me because of what I see it giving to me down the road, not monetarily and not, but experience wise, like, exactly. you know, I used to play in bands. I used to be in hockey, you know, and I've often said to my, to my friends, you know, I don't think I ever got out of those things. What I probably, what I should have with the effort that I was putting into them, you know, like I never, you know, I never got those, those quality experiences out of that because it was more in the moment stuff. But now when I look at golf, like the experiences already that I have and the experiences that I'm going to have is actually way more exciting and way more rewarding for me at this point that, uh, you know, it fills me with a lot of excitement. And, and yeah, we want to connect to people that are like minded and, you know, yeah. just just keep that keep that story going. Definitely. And I know we didn't touch on it and, you know, we don't have to in this episode. Um, you know, like you said, golf for me too has been like it life changing and probably life saving. Um, you know, I talked to you a little bit about the podcast. Um, you know, I was diagnosed with a brain tumor in 2021 and it was a really rare, uh, is a really rare benign one, but it did impact my vision and it impacted my ability to drive and um, to do a lot of things. And that was a really dark time for me being like single and living in a big city and not having a network of family 
family close by and thinking that there was a chance that I was going to potentially lose my eyesight to the point that I couldn't drive myself around anymore was really scary. And um, but being able to get out and still play golf and see that even when my eyesight was the worst, that I still could manage my way around the course. And also you could you could just get outside of that world. Um, I was like, okay, this is, I'm going to make it through this and be okay. Um, and, and again, a lot of people invited me out to do that because they knew that it cheered me up and they also knew it was something that I could still do. You know, I lost, lost my depth, um, perception and field vision. So a lot of the things I used to do with people weren't possible anymore. Like I couldn't even ride a bicycle. Like, and so if people were, um, you know, going on bike rides or doing things to socialize, you know, I was kind of left out of the crowd and, um, I do, I do really like that about um, the game and, and about the people that I've met through that is um, you, you really see like how golf, something that seems um, so silly, I guess, to some can be so impactful in such a positive way in so many parts of your life. Um, and so, yeah, anyway, I, uh, <laughs> that's another tangent. That, that might be fun. another tale for somewhere down the road. We get back together and do this again. Yeah, exactly. Well, Rhonda, I really appreciate you jumping on and doing this. Um, you know, we'll see if this is going to be a two-parter or not with uh, how long the pod went, but, uh, I, yeah, enjoyed, I enjoyed this immensely and we will have to do it again. That sounds great. Well, I hope you have a good day and definitely any time. And it was really nice to, uh, to it was really you. nice to chat with you today too. Yeah. Talk to Take you care. soon. Bye.